Good morning, everybody. As the title says, Practicalities of Capital Raising. Some 20 odd years ago, I had my first experience of doing a capital raise. My career prior to being an accountant was a young naval officer. So I went from being on the water to being a fish out of water. And the first experience I had of raising capital left me petrified. I couldn't figure it out. I felt like I was holding a cap out begging. I felt like I was being a used car salesperson, trying to get a point across for the benefit of a client. I declared at that point, this is not for me. Some 20 odd years later, I feel like I'm in an extremely privileged position. I've been involved in transactions across the United States, across China, across the United Kingdom, Southeast Asia and Australia. Every single one of those transactions involves money. What's the brilliant thing about money? You learn everything you want to learn about people. You get to see how they behave. From the most highly regarded and brand oriented institutions to the high net worth individuals, they have their agendas, they have their needs. And we in our world of service orientation, we're there to support transactions and to provide disciplined advice, professional advice in terms of, is this a good deal? Should you do the deal? And I had an interesting experience with a Chinese entrepreneur one time who said to me, would you take your own advice? I never reflected on that as much as I did after that comment. But what I learnt to look inside and understand truth I realised that most people in the business purporting to pass honest comments about capital raising probably wouldn't have invested in the projects they were seeking finance for. And so it taught me a great lesson because I had some of the experiences which put that in my face and showed me that unless I was prepared to be a co-investor or be prepared to put my own money where the request was being presented, why would you expect an institution, a high net worth individual to do the same thing? So let's talk about the practicalities of capital raising. Let's start with the Chinese proverb. Unless we change direction, we're going to end up where we're going. What some of us don't realise is where we're going, we don't actually want to go. And I think this is very, very relevant for the capital markets discussion. So what are we faced with right now? Global conditions. Look at our commodity prices. Look at our exchange rates. Look at all the dynamics and the metrics that we're faced with as decision makers. What does that say for those who have to make, about, make decisions about finance? It says you must be adaptable. You must be flexible. You must be open-minded. We're talking about the accounting profession here largely. Am I describing the epitome of the accounting profession? Conservatism. Don't over-represent. Disclaim. Put caveats on everything. Add a bit of legal twist to protect. This is the world where entrepreneurs thrive. Because adaptability, flexibility means for a large percentage of the population mass, they're paralysed with what are we going to do? For those that are sharp enough to see opportunity, it's riddled with opportunity. And there is plenty of it happening as we speak today despite headlines in the media, etc. So many of you heard the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. I question, is that still true? If you are a marginal opportunity trying to seek the best value finance, those with the gold will make the rules. If on the other hand, you have a very compelling 
great opportunity to present to somebody, money will follow. There's a little bit in between to be done to get the persuasion factor across there. Some of you may have heard of this, strengths theory. The Gallup organisation did a 30-year survey. The purpose of that survey was to look at what make good leaders, what make good managers, what make good organisations. That's a topic for another day. But what I want to point out to you is that naturally only about 3% of the population are born with an innate ability to be natural leaders or natural managers or the people who can see through the clouds and see something very clearly as an objective. So what does that mean for the rest of us? It means we've got an uphill battle to compete and to be in the game. The accounting profession doesn't roll out of a factory the 3% of the dominators of the planet who make the best decisions in finance. Yet, we are the custodians of many of the financial decisions we're the left arm of the CEOs or the chairpersons who want to make strategic decisions but need our comfort and our input to sanction what they want to do. So a key message for us as accountants is that we must get more closely tuned to the strategy of our organisation or our business. And in some places, People are CEO, CFO, CIO and CTO all in the same breath. As you get bigger, your organisations have depth of experience and different people. But the communication link between them become very important. They've got to work strategy with the numbers. It's no longer about numbers. There is so much competition for opportunity that numbers will be found as a given. It's about what else can be provided to be more compelling. I want to talk about a stakeholder model, a very simplified stakeholder model. In the centre, you have the business. Your rationale for being is the fact that you have customers. They define the problems or the needs that they have that you exist to solve for them. The employees are your exec execution team. They will be the delivery solution. Your suppliers will provide inputs and your shareholders will provide the capital model, but every one of them wants something in return differently. In essence, they're all customers. So how do we view financiers, the people we are asking to finance our project, invest in our businesses, whatever it may be? I'm suggesting that you should consider them as a customer. Because if you think of people as customers, you tend to treat them very, very differently. You go out and understand them. You go out and find what they want. And you figure out a game plan to come and deliver something to them. So perhaps a new perspective should be taken from a guy by the name of Jim Spagnola. Some of you may have read this author. Very, very wise contemporary management theorist. This guy says, we in business need to turn all of our thinking upside down. We've been conditioned with patterns of traditional behaviour and no longer in the contemporary world are the formulas and the processes of the past applicable to getting the answers you need today. You have licence to be original thinkers. He says, every one of us has 60,000 thoughts on average a day. But the most alarming thing is, about 80% of the thoughts we all have are recycled thoughts from the day before, and the day before, and generally, the baggage. So the part of our constructive thinking that happens on a day-by-day -day basis that's therefore creativity and solutions is quite limited. And when you get environments like we've got and you turn to the media, you read the newspapers, see it on the TV, hear the podcasts, and you only get the highlights of the sensational gloom and doom. 
You've got to break out of that. You as the CFOs of the future have got to be a stand apart skill set and mindset that delivers something extraordinary to decision making. If you do, you will have a job for life. If you don't, there will be an enormous redundancy queue in the future. And you don't want to be on that. I want to talk about money. People say to me in this market right now, money's hard to get. It's hard to get if you don't go about it in an appropriate way. If you don't do your homework, you don't present something that's worthwhile, that you would be prepared to invest in yourself, you're probably not going to get it. You might need to go back to the Chinese proverb and change direction a little bit. But a thought that I want to leave is that in about a decade, when you talk about world money supply, about 80% of it will be in the hands of people over 50 years of age. What does that mean? It means a lot of things, for starters. If you're in business, your future customers are going to be the ones with the money. If you're a 25-year-old IT specialist, but you're trying to sell a new system to a 60-year-old who's not that IT literate and up with the technology, but they've got the money and they're funding their children and their grandchildren's expenses, you're going to need to break through to those with the money. But think of the mutual funds and the pension funds and all the superannuation funds of the world who hold a large supply of that money and the fund managers who act for them. These fund managers are tearing around the world at the moment trying to find how they get more than 1 or 2 per cent return on their money. They have to do that. They have to do better than that because when people get old and they retire, they're going to require large amounts of money in pensions or lump sums to live their lifestyle. Only yesterday I heard on the media, Japan has a major problem. They need to import 10 million immigrants over the next 50 years. Why? Because they'll have a, a workforce of 6% sustaining the other 94% of the population of Japan. Something that Japanese politicians can't swallow yet. Because only a decade ago they were talking about exporting their retired people to resettle them in other countries. Why am I telling you all these social demographics? Because as accountants, it's not just about the money. The implications of money and the way you use money and the flow on of where your investment or your project fits becomes highly critical to a decision maker about will they or won't they want your proposition. You've got lots of choices of capital. Look at all the things on the left and that's just a small list. Then you've got to think your jurisdictions. Am I getting my money from Australia or overseas? Today is a global marketplace. But you've got to think about exchange rates. You've got to think about different sets of rules, legal jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of what you do. And look at the products. The products were always traditionally in accounting terminology. It's either debt or it's equity. What's the cost of capital? I'm interested to see how many people bring me products from the major private banks of the world that they give to the high net worth individuals of the world and the individuals can't work out what they are investing in. But the banks have covered themselves by go and see your accountant and they'll explain it to you. Many of these things are so complex that even the best intelligence of our profession struggle to have consensus about the same product with the same interpretation. So you've got to look carefully at what's there. But there is a dearth of products around the world that you have to choose from. More recently, I was dealing with people in the mining and energy space. They're getting their funding from the United States and Canada. I'm dealing with people with technology. They're seeking their funding from Scandinavian countries or they're trying to get it out of parts of the United States. I'm dealing with agribusiness 
and people are seeking finance out of China, India. I'm dealing with the energy space and they're talking about India because it's the spot where they have to sell, so they figure the finance has to be there. All of a sudden, our small business empire of Western Australia or Australia has got to be considered in the choice question. Where should I focus getting my market for finance? You may have heard of a gentleman called Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote several books, The Tipping Point, Outliers, What the Dog Saw, and a few others. These couple of points come from his Tipping Point book, which he wrote 15 years ago. And interestingly, these points align with what interesting entrepreneurs have said to me as their simplistic distilled message about how they make decisions. Firstly, is there a big picture? Can you explain the big picture to me that there's opportunity if I get involved? Secondly, have you got the right people? Do I trust and do I believe the people doing that I'm going to do business with? Now this is an interesting dilemma for capital businesses who stand in the middle of opportunities and financiers because a lot of big decision makers want to know that the people presenting the opportunity are part of the future, not just a hired gun selling an opportunity. Thirdly, does the, com the commercial model make sense? It's almost a given. It's got to make sense. Now, here's the fourth one. Confidence and passion of the presenter. The world of financiers and those financiers, whether they be high net worth individuals, family offices, institutions, banks, they are looking for a wow factor when you first give the presentation. Now one of Malcolm Gladwell's books was called Blink. Some of you may have read it. In there he refers to a thin slice decision. What he means by that is within the first 15 or 20 minutes of something being presented, psychologically there's either tune in or tune out. Now, if it's a tune out response, you've got a long battle to convince somebody to take a proposition. If it's a tune in, it's come because somebody has bought in psychologically with the fact that somebody believes the belief must flow with the message and the delivery mechanism. So when you're giving a proposition, your story, is it simple and clear? I don't know how many life science and technology businesses I've seen cluttered with so much detail on the scientific information that the financier is usually not that technically or scientifically tuned in. They're money people. They want simplistic understanding. The detail can be there for others to do in their due diligence with experts used. But don't clutter the proposition discussion with the absolute depth of detail of science and technical detail. Persuasion. Really simple. Tell me why I should do it. I was blown away when a high net worth individual said to me one day, tell me why I should do it. And I thought, well, because it's a good idea. It makes money. This is why I'm bringing it to you. But he then looked me in the eye and he said, tell me why I should do it. What do you know about me? Why will this fit my portfolio of interests? Sell me on that point and you've got me listening. Now, I must see a proposition a day go under my nose. I see people sending me 30, 40 page information memorandi or a prospecti and they expect somebody to read that 30 or 40 pages. If they're like me, if you can't see it in one paragraph, it probably isn't getting any airtime. It's about thinking about how you deliver. What you need to deliver is the elements of a message that will get the tipping point for a decision. Now, importantly, know your target customer. Know who, why you are going to them. 
acknowledge why you're going to them. Get them acknowledging that you understand and you're resonating. That is human interaction. In China, they have, have a way of doing business. They, bu they build a platform of understanding socially with friendship. It's a way of understanding, do they trust you to do more serious things, like something with my money, etc. In the West, we throw a business card across and go, take me on face value, I'm Mr. Such and Such, I've got a reputation, let's just talk the business. The dichotomy of different ways of doing things, well, in a global world, you've got to cover all bases, whatever is needed, etc. And a point there that I want to say is a lot of people dress business opportunities up when in fact they're overvalued, they're marginal, or they're near distressed. And what I can say to you is that finances and their teams are so sharp at uncovering distressed, overvalued propositions. There should not be more movement than about 15 to 20 per cent in pricing when you're negotiating something. I've seen situations where deals have turned from 100% of the price down to 25% of the price and still heading south because the people are desperate to just get a deal done. That says to me someone has overcooked an opportunity. They've dressed it up so much, the credibility's being lost, the, 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 whatever representations are being made are going to be lost in true value. In terms of transaction readiness, People sometimes want to jump ahead of the game and they're just eager to get the deal done. You've got to know what you want. I've had people come to me and say, look, we want to raise $25 million or $5 million, any number. And we're flexible how we do it. Well, you don't give kids a blank cheque. You don't give people the opportunity to have a blank page to tell you how they're going to value your business and what they think you're worth, because they're gonna have no confidence that the management team or the team that are in that business actually know how to, how to value value of the business. Decision makers are looking for how you present the strength of character of people. All business is people doing business and making decisions. It's not the widgets that sell themselves. They're great for old traditional businesses of manufacturing regimes where you could scale up volume. But in a service oriented world and in an IP world where the IP is worth more than the tangible assets in many businesses around the world, you've got to think again. You need to make sure that you're ready to be due diligence. If you do your job pro properly with your proposition and somebody says, let's get into it, let's have a look. I've had situations that I've experienced where people have said, look, we need a month to get a few things sorted out. We've got a few loose ends, there's a couple of contingent liabilities, we wouldn't want people to see that, or whatever the situation is. Get your housekeeping in order, pick your timing. It's why you see in the market sometimes people pull IPOs. They elect not to go forward. Either the market's not right, or there's something in house that's gotta be dealt with before they're ready to show their best position. And this, target your financier with a hidden game plan. You must have a game plan. If I'm going to a high net worth individual in China, I will have a completely different approach if I'm going to an institution in New York or somewhere else. Put effort into your game plan. Go back to the Chinese proverb, you may need to change direction if you are going about it the same way. And the reason I put on an earlier slide the stakeholder model is because not all stakeholders receive the same things the same way. And it means different things to each one of them. So if you think you can do a standard kit of information and have one size fits all, that's okay if they're all similar targets. But if you're trying to get a cross-section of different types of finances, you need to think, is my toolkit right? And now what's the mechanism that I do it? A lot of people say to me today, isn't it great with the internet? You can just email these things off and you expect to get a reply, a decision that's a $5 million decision or a $25 million decision or even higher. 
It just won't happen that way. If it is, I want to know who does it because you'll save me a lot of time in the work I do. But you've got to engage. Engagement is important. And I think in the world of technically literacy and the new devices we have today, which we call connectivity, we're actually disconnecting more than we are engaging appropriately. We need to lift the bar in terms of that. When do you apply? Think of the best entrepreneurs on the planet. When do they invest? When everybody else is in dilemma. When everybody else is exiting. So what does that mean in the capital markets logic? It means be ready at all times. Be ready to approach finances if you don't need finance. Ever heard the saying, a bank will only give you money when you don't need it? Well, that's the best position you're going to be in. Go and get what you can have, even if you don't need it. Practice getting in the game. We don't practice enough about getting finance. And if I had gone back to my very first experience of capital raising 20 odd years ago, I'm lucky I had people around me who said, stay at it, keep doing it, you know, you'll learn a lot from it. And I can honestly say I have. Today, I think I'm one of the most privileged and lucky people on the planet for the experiences, and I might add, 70% of those experiences have been how people have said no to me. Now, in the book James Gladwell wrote called Outliers, he harps on a very important thing. It doesn't matter whether you're Bill Gates, Michael Jordan in the celebrity sports world, or a politician of renown, he says the true successful outliers are ones who have practiced almost 10,000 hours of what they do. Now, what's that mean for us? 10 or 12 or 15 years of our career being in the game of doing what we do. But we have a portfolio of responsibilities and probably 5% to 10% is being in the game. That means if you expect the proficiency factor of somebody who's an expert at what they do and you think as a part-time I can do this in between my intray and my other responsibilities, you've got a lot of practice and a lot of no's to be given to you. So you need to be in the game. I think that's enough said on that. So here are my suggestions. Have a real understanding of your own value and what drives value in your own business. Know what capital you want and formulate your proposition and leave a little bit of room for flexibility. Don't go with a blank page that you call flexibility. That's too much flexibility. Prepare your presentation. Research your target financiers and align your presentation to what they're going to need. Test your presentation. It doesn't matter if you don't need it. Test it. Treat it like you do need it. Don't treat it like practice. Because the attitude psychologically is if you're practicing, you're practicing. Treat it like you're actually in the game and every minute counts. You will learn far more that way. And if universities learnt to teach people that way, they wouldn't just practice doing assignments and they wouldn't just practice doing tests. They would be live demonstrators of knowledge. And yet, I'm sad to say this and I don't wish to be derogatory to my own profession, but we have some of the smartest people on the planet. But they're going to be like books in libraries. If nobody's checking out the book and reading them, those books will become redundant. You've got to find a way to promote what's in those books and in what's in the minds of our profession. Add competitive tension. Don't just limit yourself to certain parties. Where you can, add competitive tension. If you are looking for customers, that's exactly what they do to you. They want the best price. They want the best service. You're out there seeking customers. You want to offer the best compelling competitive advantage, the sustainability, the relationship whatever it is. And lastly, ensure your presenter is not a reader of the presentation. 
The presenter has got to be living 100% the presentation. So here's my parting thoughts from H. Jackson Brown, author of Life's Little Instruction Book. Nothing to do with finance, by the way. Opportunity dances with those already on the floor. So get in the game. And then Martha Graham says, nobody cares if you can't dance well, just get up and dance. Great dancers are not great dancers because of their skills. They are great because of their passion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening.